Welcome to this video on ionic bonding. Many of the most important compounds we interact with every day, such as table salt, are formed all thanks to ionic bonds. Ionic bonding is one of the major mechanisms of chemical bonding in general, and chemistry is all about bonds. In this video, we will first quickly cover the different types of chemical bonding, then go on to describe ionic bonding in particular, then go over some properties of ionic compounds, how to name these compounds, and finally some chemical reactions which involve these ionic compounds. So let's get straight into it. A chemical bond is a force that holds two or more atoms together in a molecule or lattice. It is formed by the interaction between the electrons of the atoms involved in the bond. The electrons can be shared or transferred between the atoms, resulting in the formation of a compound. Chemical bonds can be covalent, ionic, or metallic, depending on the type of atoms involved in the bond and the way in which they interact. Covalent bonds involve the sharing of electrons between atoms, while ionic bonds are characterized by the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. In metallic bonds, electrons are delocalized and shared between the cations of the metal. The properties of a substance formed by atoms bonded together can differ greatly from those of the individual atoms. Let's begin with a closer look at ionic bonds. Ionic bonds typically occur between a metal and a nonmetal due to a high difference in electronegativity. Recall that the electronegativity value measures how much a particular atom is attracted to electrons in a bond. If we look at sodium and chlorine, sodium has an electronegativity value of 0.9 compared to chlorine at 3.2. This means chlorine has a much stronger attraction for the electrons in a bond than sodium. The difference in electronegativity values is 2.3, and the general guideline states that if this difference is greater than 1.8, the more electronegative atom will take the electrons from the less electronegative atom completely, no sharing, but a total transfer of electrons. As a result of this complete transfer of electrons, a cation and an anion form. The ionic bond is the electrostatic attraction between the positively charged cation and the negatively charged anion. So now we know how ionic bonds form, but what do ionic compounds look like at a molecular level? How do the ions arrange themselves? The ions that compose an ionic compound form a crystalline structure called an ionic lattice. An ionic lattice refers to the arrangement of ions in a regular, three-dimensional pattern in an ionic compound. Because of the strong electrostatic attraction between the cation and the anion, the energy required to break the ionic bond is quite high. Therefore, ionic compounds tend to have high melting and boiling points. Consequently, ionic compounds are usually found in the solid state at room temperature. As a result, the cations and anions are locked within the lattice structure and are therefore immobile. As a result, ionic solids do not conduct electricity. Once heated past the melting point and in a molten state, the ions are free to move, and the substance does become electrically conductive. Although the ionic bond is strong, the crystalline structure can shatter when a force is applied, generally making ionic compounds brittle. While the solubility of ionic compounds is affected by the strength of the electrostatic attraction within the lattice structure or the strength of the ionic bond, other factors are involved in determining a substance's solubility, including the interactions of the ions with the solvent. So we just looked at how ionic compounds look and some of their properties. Next, we'll look into how to come up with the chemical formulas for ionic compounds. For example, how do we know that sodium chloride is NaCl and not, say, Na2Cl? To determine the formula of an ionic compound, we look at the simplest mole ratio of the cations and anions. 
This is the empirical formula for the compound and is known as a formula unit. We know an ion forms when a neutral atom gains or loses electrons. From the atomic structure unit, we know how to use the number of valence electrons to determine the simplest charges of monoatomic ions of the S and P block elements. These simple ion charges reflect the gain or loss of electrons for an elemental atom to achieve an octet structure. When an ionic compound contains a transition metal, the gain or loss of electrons is a bit more complex due to electrons in the d orbitals. Transition metals can have multiple oxidation states, which is reflected in the compound name. An ionic compound formula is written so the formula unit is electrically neutral or has a net zero charge. For example, if we look at an aluminum cation with a plus 3 charge and an oxygen anion with a minus 2 charge, we determine the least common multiple allowing equalization of these charges. Both 2 and 3 go into 6, so we can think in terms of a valid mathematical equation, 2 times plus 3 plus 3 times minus 2 equals 0, so there is no net charge within the formula unit. Therefore, the formula unit has two aluminum ions and three oxygen ions, and the formula is Al2O3. By this time in chemistry, you have seen and probably know a number of polyatomic ions, that is, ions that are groupings of more than one atom. Here are some of the most common polyatomic ions that you might see in IB chemistry. The process of formula writing with polyatomic ions is the same as with monoatomic ions. The goal is a zero net charge within a formula unit. If a calcium ion with a plus two charge is combined with a hydroxide ion of a minus one charge, two hydroxide ions are needed to balance the two plus charge of calcium. The formula for hydroxide or any polyatomic ion never changes in the process of ionic formula writing. The formula becomes CaOH2. Parentheses must be used to indicate that there are two groups of the polyatomic ion hydroxide. Just a note, the hydroxide is an ion with an overall charge of minus 1, and the entire polyatomic ion is involved in ionic bonding with the calcium ion. However, the oxygen and hydrogen within the polyatomic ion are covalently bonded. So that's how we come up with chemical formulas for ionic compounds, but how do we name them correctly? When naming an ionic compound, the cation is named first, either the element or polyatomic ion name followed by the anion. If the anion is polyatomic, just name the ion. If the anion is a monoatomic ion, the element name ending is changed to ide. Knowing this, let's go over some examples. Al2O3 has aluminum as a cation. Remember, for cations, we keep the name as is. Oxygen is the anion here, and remember, for monoatomic ions, we change the ending to ide. This makes aluminum oxide as the correct name for this compound. Next up, we have CaOH2. Here we have calcium as the cation, so we just keep the name as is. Our anion is this time polyatomic, so we also keep that name as is. This makes calcium hydroxide as the correct name. And finally, we have NH43PO4. This is a compound where both the ions are polyatomic, so both ions keep their names, making ammonium phosphate the correct name for this compound. So now we've gone over the basics of ionic bonding. We will next go over some of the chemistry of ionic bonding, namely how ionic compounds behave in single and double replacement reactions. Net ionic chemical equations are commonly written with double replacement reactions, and the ions that appear on both sides of the chemical equation are eliminated or cancelled out. 
when aqueous sodium carbonate and aluminum nitrate are mixed together, the precipitate aluminum carbonate forms, and the two transparent solutions become cloudy. Both reactant solutions are soluble and therefore consist of individual ions in solution. Any aqueous ions that are not part of the formation of the precipitate are called spectator ions and are eliminated from the net ionic equation. In single replacement or substitution reactions, monoatomic ions found in various ionic compounds can be replaced by a different element as a reactant in its elemental form. Just like the double replacement reactions, sometimes these reactant pairings generate a chemical reaction, but sometimes not. The reactivity series lists the elements from the most reactive to the least reactive and is used when determining if a single replacement reaction proceeds. Note that metals and nonmetals appear on separate lists because metals tend to lose electrons or be oxidized, while nonmetals tend to gain electrons or be reduced. The most reactive metal at the top of the list, lithium, is more readily oxidized than the elements found below it. The higher a metal is on the list, the more readily oxidized, the more easily it will displace another metal in a compound, and therefore the more reactive the metal is considered to be. Conversely, for nonmetals, the element at the top of the list is most readily reduced, will displace another nonmetal in a compound, and is therefore considered to be more reactive. Let's look at a couple of examples. In this first reaction, chlorine gas is bubbled through lithium iodide solution. We need to consult the reactivity series to determine if this reaction proceeds. In a single replacement reaction, the reactant in the elemental form can potentially replace the ion in the compound to which it is most similar. Metals replace metals, and nonmetals will replace nonmetals. This means that the chloride ion might form and replace the iodide ion in the compound lithium iodide, as both are halogens and form ions with a 1 minus charge. We can consult the reactivity series for the nonmetals to see that chlorine is more reactive than iodine. Therefore, chlorine is more likely to gain electrons than iodine and want to be in an ion form within a compound. Additionally, we know this from our knowledge of the periodic table. Chlorine lies above iodine in the halogens group 17. Hence, it has a smaller atomic radius and a stronger affinity for electrons, so it's more reactive than iodine. The single replacement reaction will proceed as written here. In contrast, a single replacement reaction involving a copper 2 nitrate solution with silver metal would not proceed, with no chemical change observed. Referring to the reactivity series, silver metal lies below copper and is less reactive. Silver is less likely to lose electrons to form a metallic cation than copper is. Silver will remain in its elemental state and no reaction will occur. Let's quickly recap the important points of ionic bonding. Number one, there is a complete transfer of electrons to form ions. Two, the cation and anion are arranged in a crystalline ionic lattice. Three, the formula of an ionic compound is the lowest mole ratio of ions and is called a formula unit. And four, the strength of the ionic lattice determines properties such as the hardness, solubility, and melting point of ionic compounds.